Okay. okay, so given that I've started recording, perhaps I'll just begin the introductions and if anyone else joins after the beginning, then that's 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 all well and good. So th again, thanks everybody for coming on <laughs> these very busy days. Uh, it's really great to see you all and happy new year, I suppose. Um, this is the, the second half of the second seminar series um, extending into hopefully into around April um, of 2023 um, and we're still kind of working within the loose framework of, of uh, the developmental stages of research um, and, and, and what those different stages might look like in relation to individual projects. So uh, we're still within the, the kind of sub theme of collaborations today and um, so it's my very great pleasure to, to have um, Dr. Siva Marimuthu and Dr. Islam Abohela uh, with us today. And um, uh, Islam's going to begin. So I'll just begin by introducing Islam and um, then he will give a 20 minute presentation there or thereabouts. If there's some discussion, we'll have that immediately after. And, and then we'll move on to Siva's uh, presentation and the same format again. So. Um, yes, I'm very happy to introduce Islam, who's an architect with experience in research as well as in teaching architecture, interior design in building science and design related modules. His research interests and publications focus on implementing simulation tools in understanding building physics, energy performance in buildings, retrofitting micro renewable sources of energy in urban areas and the effect of behavioural interventions on energy consumption in buildings. His publications also cover his research on the image of the future city and its architecture, specifically in science fiction films. So that's a really fantastically broad set of skills. And over to you, Islam. Thank you. Many thanks, Becky. I'll start by sharing my screen. So let's see. Can you see my screen right now? Yes, perfect. Uh, yeah, just the, the first slide, yeah? Yes. OK, then. Right, uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, those who were able to make it and uh, attend today's uh, seminar. I, I know everybody's busy nowadays with the mocking, so thank you very much for attending today's uh, seminar. Um, which is part of the DTA research seminar series. Uh, this series is mainly focused on collaboration. So um, this uh, research is actually done in collaboration with uh, colleagues from Newcastle University and uh, London South Bank University, where I'm currently, in addition to my role here at Staffordshire University as a lecturer in architecture, I'm also a visiting professor at London South Bank University, working on research investigating the integration of uh, wind turbines uh, within buildings, as you can see in the images in front of you right now. Um, the, the buildings which you see in front of you right now are all integrating wind turbines within buildings. But unfortunately, uh, the majority of them are not working for various reasons. And I'm going to touch on that um, in my presentation uh, today. So the, this, this presentation covered part of our research on uh, a methodology for um, assessing the optimum uh, roof mounting locations for urban wind turbines. So there are, there are several types of integration of wind turbines within the built environment. One of them is uh, roof mounted wind turbines, and this is, uh, is the focus of uh, uh, today's presentation. So the, the whole idea about bringing in renewables and wind turbines within the built environment as uh, playing a role in combating climate change. Climate change is obviously the, the, the defining crisis of our time, according to the Intergovernmental Panel for, uh, uh, for Climate Change. So when it comes to buildings, since most of the activities uh, take place in buildings, um, buildings are actually responsible for 21% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, here in the UK, um, the, according to the House of Commons Environmental Audit Committee, the UK's built environment is actually responsible for 25% of the UK's greenhouse gas emissions, which is more than the world's average. So architects and designers, they have a role in combating climate change through reducing the carbon footprint of buildings. This could be through different stages 
uh, through the design stage, the construction stage, the usage stage, uh, until the disposal stage of the building. Uh, power is needed uh, while uh, we construct our buildings. Uh, power is needing uh, for uh, is needed for operating our buildings, and power is also needing for disposal of our buildings. Um, currently, we're depending on renewables, photovoltaics, maybe wind turbines, in addition to conventional sources of energy as well. So the aim here or the ob objective is to depend more on renewable sources of energy and depend more on uh, wind turbines and bring in wind turbines to the built environment. Renewable, according to the 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 uh, Green Building Council in a publication uh, titled Net Zero Carbon Buildings: A Framework uh, Definition, there are actually ten key requirements for new buildings to be uh, net zero in terms of operational carbon. Two of these requirements are related to the energy used in buildings and how we supply power to our buildings. And the main uh, aspect here is to depend more on, re on renewable sources of energy, such as wind turbines. So wind turbines has a role to play in terms of providing our buildings uh, with uh, power. There are other sources of renewable sources of energy, such as biomass energy, hydroelectric energy, solar energy, tidal energy, hydrogen fuel cells, geothermal energy, um, wave energy, and obviously wind energy. So what we're looking at here in this presentation is to bring in uh, wind turbines to the built environment uh, for very important reasons. One of these important reasons is uh, to overcome the transmission losses which happens when we transfer the power from the point of the uh, generation to the point uh, of, uh, of usage. Um, so when it comes to large scale wind turbines, wind farms, um, the source is clean. Um, when uh, energy is a renewable source of energy and it is rel uh, relatively cheap. But there are also problems associated with large scale wind turbines, which micro scale wind turbines within the built environment can overcome. These are one of the things is that wind is unpredictable. Wind can change direction. Wind can be strong at some point and not as strong to um, generate power at other uh, times. So. We, we cannot depend only on uh, wind energy. We should have other backup plants, such as maybe photovoltaic cells, and these two systems might be able to complement each other. Also, when the wind turbines, uh, the blades of the wind turbines, they rotate, they produce noise, which is uh, sometimes not, uh, doesn't provide a, a very good environment uh, in the vicinity of these uh, wind turbines. Also, people consider uh, wind turbines, some people consider them as a bad feature of the landscape. I personally consider them as a, get, a good feature of the landscape, but other people consider them a bad feature in the in natural landscape and they shouldn't be there. Also, the fact that they are uh, uh, built remotely in uh, like on offshore, onshore, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they suffer from the power, suffer from transmission losses in the form of heat energy in the wires from the point of generation to the point uh, of uh, usage. Uh, also, um, there are um, infrastructure costs which are associated with building wind turbines so that we can build roads to go to these remote areas so that we would be able to maintain uh, these uh, wind turbines. Uh, as for urban wind turbines, they have the same advantages of large scale wind turbines, wind farms, uh, uh, in addition to other uh, advantages as well. Um, First advantage is the accelerating uh, effect, effect which happens when wind uh, hits an obstacle. When, when the wind hits a building, the wind speed actually uh, increases in some areas. And um, uh, any slight increase in the wind speed would result in a, a, a significant increase in the energy yield from a wind turbine because the, the power from uh, the power generated from a wind turbine is directly proportional to cube the wind speed. So we should take advantage of this accelerating uh, effect, which happens when the wind hits uh, a building. Also, the Yo system, which is the system responsible for turning the horizontal axis wind turbine in wind farms to be facing the prevailing wind, um, is not uh, available in the urban wind turbines. This Yo system is mainly for capturing the wind and capturing the power from the wind. When the wind turbine is doing this turning to be facing the prevailing wind, 
the blades are not actually rotating, so the wind turbine itself is not generating any power. It's actually consuming power to move or to rotate the wind turbine to be facing the, um, the, the, the prevailing wind. This is not the case for uh, urban wind turbines because the building actually funnel the wind and direct the wind towards the installed wind turbine. Another aspect is the landscape aspect, which I mentioned uh, earlier. So this is not the case here since we're talking about the built environment. The buildings are already there, so they're like acting as the mounting mast for the uh, wind turbines. Also, the transmission losses uh, is, not is no longer relevant because um, the point of generation is the same point of usage. So we are seeking to be self-sufficient in terms these buildings are seeking to be self-sufficient in terms of uh, energy. Also, the infra infrastructure costs uh, are not relevant in this scenario. And above all, uh, the wind turbines actually send a visual message about adopting renewables, about uh, um, uh, combating climate change, about promoting the ideas of reducing the carbon footprint of buildings. So this is not actually measured in, in, in kilowatt hours or in pound sterling, but it has a real uh, value in terms of promoting, adopting, combating climate change. So urban wind turbines have high potentials, but we see few installations. Uh, why is that? Um, one of the reasons is that um, there were some previous unconscious installations of uh, wind turbines within uh, the built environment because some people are enthusiastic about the idea. So they go to these DIY like stores and get a, a micro scale wind turbine. They uh, install it on top of the roof in the place where it's uh, most secured and they don't do any proper wind assessment around the building. Um, so obviously the wind turbine would end up not generating any electricity. And also it's attributed to the unfavorable wind conditions within the built environment. Uh, for wind turbines to operate in an efficient way, the, the, the flow has to be laminar and the flow within the built environment is actually turbulent and the wind speed needs to be above a certain limit. Uh, and actually this is not usually happening within the built environment since the building sometimes they make the wind speed less than the required wind speed. So what happens is that these wind turbines, uh, they don't generate any uh, power and they are only producing noise. So this is promoting the bad reputation of urban wind turbines. So the, the building you see in front of you right now here is uh, is an elephant and castle in in, um, in London, and they have like the, the design team have decided to install these three wind turbines on top of the building. They're actually roof mounted wind turbines, and um, they were expecting that the building would uh, these wind turbines would generate eight percent of the uh, power needed for that building. And they were doing so, but unfortunately, due to the vibration and due to the noise which is which are coming from this uh, these wind turbines, they have decided to shut them down because I, I believe there is a restaurant up there and there were so many complaints about that. So um, we need to investigate what are the conditions needed for these wind turbines to be efficient and operating properly. So in this research, we are trying to answer these questions, where to put a wind turbine above different uh, roof shapes, and which roof shapes perform better in terms of accelerating wind? And what difference does it make uh, to put a wind turbine on top of a roof? So in terms of the energy yield of that roof mounted wind turbine. So when we look at research, there are three main strands in research related to the integration of, build, uh, of wind turbines within the built in, uh, environment. The first is about the types of integrating wind turbines within the built environment. The second is about um, the, the tools used for assessing wind flow within uh, the built environment. And the third is about the feasibility of integrating wind turbines within the built environment. This research is con uh, concerned with building mounted wind turbines and using uh, CFD simulation, which is computational flow, flow dynamic simulation for assessing wind flow so that we would be able to determine the environmental feasibility of uh, roof mounted uh, wind turbines. So the investigated roof shapes are flat roof, a domed roof, uh, a gabled roof, a pyramidal roof, a vaulted roof, uh, a wedged roof, and I've, I have specified specific location on top of each roof where we measure specific uh, flow variables using CFD simulation. So what we do is that we build a domain using um, uh, the, the software which is used is ANSYS Fluent. 
um, and you put the building or uh, the, the shape, whatever the shape is within that domain, it has to be, uh, we have to specify where exactly we need to put it based on pe best practice guidelines related to CFD simulations. And we use the um, an inlet from the left hand side, which is simulating the atmospheric boundary layer uh, profile. Um, in order to have confidence in the simulation, we need to make something called a mesh independent study. Uh, in that study, um, we uh, are supposed to, be, to do three different mesh sizes, and we need to make sure that the simulation results are not changing in these three mesh sizes, so that we would make sure that the mesh quality is actually not affecting the results coming from the CFD simulation. Another aspect as well, which is proposed in this methodology, which is very important, is the horizontal homogeneity of the atmospheric boundary layer uh, profile. So in, in more simpler words, it means that the profile of the atmospheric boundary layer, which is applied at the inlet of the domain, should not change across the domain. So we specify some boundary conditions. These boundary conditions should not affect this atmospheric boundary layer profile, which we have applied at the inlet of the domain. So if we plot certain variables, such as the velocity, the turbulent dissipation rate, the turbulent kinetic energy at lines L1, 2, 3, 4, 5, these vertical lines which you see in front of you right now, these variables should not be changing. We shouldn't see any discrepancies between them. Um, the boundary condition which has been specified is like um, symmetry for the top and the side uh, boundaries and pressure outlet for the outlet boundary uh, condition. As for the inlet boundary condition, it was a velocity inlet uh, user defined function satisfying these equations for the velocity, the turbulent kinetic energy and the turbulent dissipation rate. After that, we plotted the velocity magnitude across these five lines, which I've shown in the previous slide. And we, as, as we can see here, uh, they coincide. There is no discrepancy at all between these plotted velocity magnitude at these five vertical lines. The same thing applies to the turbulent dissipation rate and the turbulent kinetic energy. So now we can say that we have achieved a horizontal homogeneity of the atmospheric boundary layer profile, and we can use it in our simulation. Another step which is really needed for the um, uh, for in this methodology and proposed is the validation of the CFD simulation. And the most famous case here in uh, which you can see in front of you right now is the turbulent flow around a surface mounted cube, which is the case of the uh, flat roof which we have. Uh, in this uh, in this scenario, we need to um, we need to make uh, the assessment qualitatively and quantitatively. Qualitatively, in the way in which the flow goes around that surface mounted cube. So the first stream, which is approaching the building, is deviated over the cube, and the second stream is deviated down the windward facade, and the other two streams deviate to the two sides of the cube. And at the point of the deviation, there is the stagnation point where we find the maximum pressure. So these are all the things we are looking for when it comes to the CFD simulation to make sure that the simulation is accurate. The air flowing downwards forms a standing vortex in front of the windward facade. And the corner streams and flow separation areas are formed at the sides and on top of the cube. Uh, and slow rotating vortices behind the cube are also formed. So these are the things which we need to look at when we assess how the flow flow around this uh, building. So we compare, for example, the wind tunnel test results with the CFD simulations. And as you can see here for the horizontal streamwise velocity path lines, there is an agreement between the CFD simulation and the wind tunnel test uh, results in terms of the formation of the vortices, the stagnation point, the vortices on the sides of the cube. In the vertical axis, uh, in the vertical streamwise velocity path lines as well, we can see all these uh, aspects of the flow around uh, surface mounted the cube in a turbulent channel uh, flow. Uh, quantitatively, we, we, we measure the pressure coefficient along the central line of the windward facade, the roof and the leeward facade. And we compare this to the wind tunnel test results and we can see there is agreement between the CFD results and the wind, uh, the, and the wind tunnel test results. So now we have confidence in our, um, uh, let's say, simulation variables, which we have specified. And now what we can do is we can measure the streamwise velocity uh, and we can measure the turbulence intensity and we will normalize 
these values against um, these values at the same location of the domain in an empty domain without the building being there. So for the flat roof case, as we can see in front of us right now, um, the location of the maximum recorded turbulence intensity, and this is this should actually be avoided because we want minimum turbulence intensity and maximum streamwise velocity. So the, 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 the recorded maximum turbulence intensity was at 0.13 uh, at a height of 1.1 H, and it reached 2.8 times the turbulence intensity at the same location when the building is not there. And the location of the maximum streamwise velocity was at location of 0.23, uh, at a height of 1.45, the height of the building, and the acceleration reached 1.095 of the streamwide velocity in the same location without the building being there. It has been noticed that there is an area of uh, maximum turbulence which extends uh, until 1.3 times the height of the building. So this area should be avoided. So although there will be uh, more stream, like faster wind in this area, we should avoid it due to the high turbulence intensity in this area. So that's the location where a, um, a roof mounted wind turbine should be located on a flat uh, roof. For the domed roof, it's at the midpoint, which is 0.33 at a height of 1.3 H um, and the acceleration uh, reached 1.12 the stream wise velocity in an empty domain. For the gabled roof, it's at 0.51 uh, at a height of 1.6 H and the, uh, the streamwise velocity reached 1.05, um, the streamwise velocity in an empty domain. For a pyramidal roof, the velocity uh, reached 1.05, like the previous case, at 0.42, uh, at a height of 1.3 H. And for the vaulted roof, it's actually reached um, 1.6 times uh, the streamwise velocity in an empty domain at a height of 1.3 H. For the wedged roof, it's at 0.51 at a height of 1.45 h, and uh, the acceleration is 1.03 uh, uh, u. So these are the questions which I've asked at the start of the presentation, where to put a wind turbine above different roof shapes, and I believe now we've answered these questions for the flat, the domed, the gabled, pyramidal, vaulted, and uh, the wedge roof. Um, the second question is, which roof shape performs better in terms of accelerating wind? Anybody wants to guess? I cannot see the, the chat, so if anybody wants to give a go, Siva, you're an expert in CFD. What do you think? All right, um, I'll Yeah, go okay, ahead. Number three. <laughs> <laughs> so, Becky's saying number three. The, um, the number I, I would guess, sorry, I would guess number one, two, three, four, fifth one. The fifth one, the vaulted roof. Actually, I was thinking it's going to be number three, but after the simulation, I found that that Siva's right, which is the vaulted roof. So the first one, which is accelerating the wind more than any other shape, is the vaulted roof, then the domed roof. So it seems that these forms, these curved forms, accelerate the wind more than uh, the edges. Actually, the third, um, the third choice actually has more acceleration than all the other uh, roof shapes but it was associated with high levels of turbulence as well. So this is why we did not choose uh, the gabled roof and we chose the uh, vaulted roof. Then the flat roof comes in the third place, then the pyramidal roof, then the, um, the, the gabled roof, then the wedged roof. So what difference does it make in terms of the power generation? This is the equation um, for the power generation from a wind turbine. And as we can see here, the power is directly proportional to cube the streamwise velocity, which means that any slight increase in the streamwise velocity would result in a significant increase in the power generated uh, from the installed wind turbine. So for the vaulted roof, there is actually an increase of 56% more than a wind turbine installed in the same location at the same height without the building being there. For the domed roof, we have 40% increase. For the flat roof, we have 31% increase for the pyramidal and the gabled roof, both of them 16%, and for the wedged roof, it's 9% increase. So it can be concluded that wind flow characteristics are strongly dependent on roof shapes, and all the investigated roof shapes have an accelerating effect on wind velocity above them, 
and of all the investigated roof shapes, the vaulted roof is the optimum roof shape for mounting wind turbines. And of all the investigated roof shapes, the wedge roof had the least accelerating effect on wind velocity. And there is a region of high turbulence which extends to 1.3 times the height of the building. This area should be avoided. But uh, this area of high turbulence is also characterized by high streamwise velocity. And if wind turbines which can be, uh, withstand high levels of turbulence, such as, for example, vertical axis wind turbines, they can withstand turbulence. The increase in the energy yield could reach uh, uh, up to 90% in uh, the case of the vaulted roof. Uh, so that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that was fascinating. Uh, Islam, thank you. I'm sort of obviously uh, a great deal of the calculations was uh, well beyond me, but uh, the principles are really fascinating. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but I wonder if anyone out there who's well qualified, more qualified than me to ask questions has any first. Maria, you have your hand up. Hi, I'm not sure about more qualified, <laughs> but um, I think what is interesting is um, because it's a session about collaboration. Uh, what I was wondering is uh, because obviously I'm, I'm just thinking on the architectural design process and especially teaching to students. At what stages of the design process do you think is are the best to start the, those collaborations? Because obviously, you know, uh, the problem with those builds that you showed in the beginning is that the building is already built, things are already in place, there is vibration, the space is not being able to use. So, uh, at which stage and with which sort of materials, maybe through beam building, information modeling, is it possible to do that? And how do we embed that into the, you know, into the teaching of architecture? Yeah, yeah. Many thanks, Maria, for uh, this question. Very good question, actually. And um, uh, the I, I would say that it, it's really important uh, to start very early at the design stage. You mentioned the buildings, which was on the first slide, and. Um, uh, these buildings, for example, one example of them is the Bahrain World Trade Center, where you have three wind turbines stacked on top of each other. And um, um, this was designed by Atkins. Uh, the designer was Sean, uh, Sean Keeler from South Africa, a very well-known architect. And the, the idea since the start was to integrate wind turbines within the design. And that was the start point. That has affected the way in which the building was designed since the start. Anybody asking any? No, sorry. Was that no? That's. Are you still going, Islam? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yep. I was hearing a voice in the background. Um, okay. So, so it needs to be. It needs to be since the early stages of the design of the project. So you're asking about the students, Maria. How can we integrate that with our students? Uh, I would say that also since the start of the the uh, the design project, when we give the brief to the students, we should allow them an opportunity to think about how the form of the building, if we're talking about this specific case of integrating wind turbines and using the, the form of the building to accelerate wind and generate more electricity, which is used by the building. So I would say that at the early stages, if we introduce this to the students and they have this idea, we need to couple them with mechanical engineering students, for example, who are like they study like CFD simulations and they are really fluent in this. This is what I personally did when I started this research. I had to go to mechanical engineering staff members, uh, learn from them, uh, participate with them in the simulation. And this is where we can start joint projects with other students in other departments as well. Um, if, if we think of it uh, as um, like an ad hoc towards the end, I think it wouldn't work uh, successfully, especially when it comes about when, when it comes to buildings which are already built, because you don't know what would be the conditions there. Because the idea of integrating wind turbines might not be feasible. There might be other buildings around this building where we want to integrate the wind turbine, which are blocking the wind from reaching the uh, roof where we want to mount the wind turbine. So a, a complete assessment of the wind resources within the site would give us inf information about uh, whether or not we can integrate the, 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 the turbine on top of any of these roofs. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
I just I, I, for me, I, I mean, I find it fascinating, and I also th I wonder uh, in relation to sort of urban planning um, whether this I, these sorts of simulations, this kind of simulation to ascertain uh, the possibilities for self-generating power in a new build, is that something that is close to being kind of rolled out into council? policy or anything like that or is there is there any sense of collaboration with urban planning on that level yeah that's that's a very good point uh, becky because uh, actually part of the research is the urban configuration and the height of the building these are two other variables which we investigated as well because the urban configuration plays a major role on on how the wind interacts with the built environment and reach a specific building which is more likely to be higher than the surrounding urban context. So definitely the the the, the urban design and how the uh, urban context is set around the specific building is very important. So let's think think also about development. Let's say if we have a, 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 a new belt and um, we decide that we're going to to uh, uh, to use wind energy, roof-mounted wind turbines. So this kind of research would be able to inform the designers and the decision makers, for example, about the roof shapes which are going to be used in this development, because we know now that the vaulted uh, the vaulted roof would be able to accelerate the wind more and would be able to generate more uh, electricity. So we can take that decision about the form of this development on the urban scale. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I know you're saying that retrofitting, you know, a, an existing building isn't ideal. Um, but for example, you know, Catalyst, can I have yeah. some turbines? Well, we have a case here, uh, Becky, the, um, the, the science building, we already have a wind turbine on top of that building. Okay, and, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, since I came, I was trying to find some information about it to like, uh, to see whether or not it's been mounted in the correct location. Um, but unfortunately today I, I couldn't get to that. Uh, but when it comes to retrofitting, the problem is that these devices are dynamic. This equipment is dynamic and they have a vibration associated with them. So if you haven't designed the building, keeping in mind these uh, vibrations um, um, in the structural design of the building, it might be too risky. But we're talking here about honestly about micro scale wind turbines the vibration which is coming from them wouldn't be that much the type of wind turbine which is on top of the science building wouldn't uh, generate wouldn't make that uh, much of a vibration which would affect the structural integrity uh, of the building so yeah like micro scale wind turbines uh, uh, they might be feasible when it comes to retrofitting but large large or medium scale wind turbines such as the bahrain uh, world trade center the elephant and castle in london uh, building this has to be since the early stages of uh, the design of the building, the structural design of the building, so that we would factor that in. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So the, the one that's on the science building, how much do you know? Well, perhaps you haven't had a chance to find out how much it actually contributes to the running of well, it's it's for uh, for teaching and demonstration purposes. Oh, so I see. It's just like for collecting as well, like weather data, and things like that. This is the information I know about. It's not for generation uh, and like uh, because sometimes the generation of the, the power is even in excess of the building, but not in our case, of course, in larger scale cases. And we can export that, that to the grid as well. So this is something we can consider. But there is actually uh, something which is happening on campus, which is on top of the catalyst the, we have an array of uh, PVs. And uh, I, I don't know uh, like um, how much energy they are generating, but they are generating a significant amount of energy which is, is used within the building itself. Sorry, what's a PV? Uh, photovoltaic cells, I'm sorry. You mean like a solar panel? Solar panels, yeah. Solar Got panels it. generating Thank power, you. yeah. You're speaking to a photographer here, I can think. <laughs> Photo, photon cells, yeah, I get that, but yeah, yeah. okay. Um, Brilliant. That's really fascinating. Thank you. Does anyone else out there have any questions um, in, the, in, in the immediate short term for Islam? Um, if not, I think thank you very much, Islam, and um, for sharing that. And I think perhaps what we'll do now is then move on. Um, so maybe if you, well, you haven't. Oh, here we go. Thank you, Maria. That's fine. 
Uh, yes, I will send the link. Absolutely. Um, OK, so uh, secondly, I, uh, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Siva Marimuthu. Um, and there he is. Uh, Siva obtained his aeronautical engineering um, related academic and research experiences from uh, his practice in India, Malaysia and UAE. That's Dubai. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I just suddenly thought, I don't know what that is. Dubai. <laughs> That's uh, United em it, Arab Emirates and, and the capital. Of course it is. is of course okay. it is. Sorry. Right. <laughs> his expertise is grounded in computational and experimental aerodynamics, and his main area of interest is the implementation of biomimetic surface patterns to solve problems in the fluid regime. Siva is currently working as a senior lecturer in aeronautical engineering within the School of Digital Technologies and the Arts. I'm very happy to hand over to you now, Siva. Thank you. Thank you, Becky, for the kind introduction and welcome you all to this uh, afternoon session. Uh, and it was quite in interesting to see that uh, Islam were also working in that same area. So I'm going to start sharing the presentation. So it's, you, you might be hearing some terms which were used in um, Islam's presentation. One moment. And there you go. Can you able to see the presentation slide? Yeah, uh, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Today uh, I'm going to uh, explain a part of my PhD research work, and then I'm going to uh, uh, share with you the collaboration that I have initiated after the completion of the research. Uh, so this is going to be a combination of research and collaboration. Um, so I think uh, in the introduction, I'm, go uh, I'm going to just uh, say the same thing. So, <laughs> so I'm going to just skip this slide, then I'll move on to the next one that is overview. So these are all the uh, topics that I'm going to deliver in today's uh, session. We are going to see the background of my research and few research questions um, about how I uh, come up with this idea and the hypothesis and the Rory blood pattern that I have developed and the analysis that I have used, which is quite similar to uh, Islam's project uh, method. Uh, the percentage of drug reduction that I have uh, that I have achieved through this solution, and then I'm going to compare that to the existing solutions. Of course, the key take takeaways from the project, and then we'll move on to the uh, collaboration related things uh, like skill gap and the communication and then how I have initiated a collaboration at the very end. Um, again, this is a boring slide. It's me again, so I'm not going to <laughs> bore you more. I'm going to skip that. So this is uh, my research background. Um, I, I hope you could see that in July 2018, the European Airbus manufacturer, that is Airbus, uh, the aircraft manufacturer that is Airbus announced that nearly 37,400 new aircraft uh, valued at $5.8 uh, trillion are required over 20 years. So, so just think about the uh, number of aircraft that are going to be in the uh, airspace in over 20 years of time. It will double the world passenger uh, market and also the number of passengers who is going to use this uh, aircraft um, transport uh, will be a lot. And of course, whenever there is an increase in the number of aircraft and that will uh, create uh, some consequences in the environment. So we will discuss about that in detail uh, in this research. So you can just have a look at the uh, uh, Airbus orders and deliveries uh, based on the previous year. I have uh, given a small picture of that. The total orders that they have received up to 2022 uh, was 21,706 aircraft of all these types. Uh, these are all commercial aircraft starts from uh, passenger, uh, cargo carrier, uh, from normal uh, narrow to jumbo jets. And they have delivered uh, so far 14,362. There is a lot of 
backlog, backlog around 7000 uh, aircraft yet to be delivered. So there is more they are expecting in the next 20 years. So uh, it's going to be more than 48000 uh, aircraft uh, are, are in the world within next 20 years. So that's a lot. So before I start to explain the problem, I would like to because uh, the audience are quite common, so I'm going to explain you about the basic operation of an aircraft before I uh, uh, explain uh, the research problem. So this is the um, uh, basic picture of an, a commercial aircraft. You could see over here at the top, and uh, there are four forces acting on an aircraft, which is, uh, we call it as lift, that is acting upwards, and uh, gravity acting downwards, thrust acting frontwards, and drag that is acting backwards. So the most important uh, force is a lift force, which will help the aircraft to lift off from the ground. And that is, we call it as a positive aerodynamic force. And then we have got the negative aerodynamic force called drag, which is the disturbance, of course. So what we normally uh, do when we design an aircraft, we normally try to uh, generate more amount of lift force. And then we will try to keep the drag force as minimum as possible you know the drag is a disturbance as i mentioned before so if we keep the disturbance minimum then we can able to uh, make use of the effective airflow to lift off the aircraft from the ground and we have got the propulsive force that is thrust which is generated by the aircraft engine uh, so this this uh, thrust force pushes the aircraft frontwards so uh, this thrust is equivalent to drag, but these two are acting at opposite sides to one another. And we have got the weight, of course. Uh, it is because of the acceleration due to gravity, the, the gravitational force. It is because of the mass of the structure. So you can call it as weight due to gravity. So these are the four main uh, forces that is acting on an aircraft. And uh, there are two aerodynamic forces, lift and drag. And uh, there is one propulsive force, that is thrust, thrust, and we have got one gravitational force. So in this project, uh, this is an aerodynamics-based project, we will cover more uh, on the lift force and the drag force, and then we will try to connect that with the thrust force. Okay, uh, now you know which force is actually pushing the aircraft forward. So that is engines, right? So which generates uh, the propulsion and that pushes the aircraft frontwards, of course. Now comes the real problem. Why we require this uh, research at the time of starting the research? Everybody will have this research question. So we have seen the details of the aircraft demand for the uh, next 20 years. So the more number of aircraft will, of course, contribute to larger amount of carbon emissions. Um, you know that we are in the global uh, warming environment and we, we are trying to uh, reduce the emission from all sorts of industries and entities uh, required to uh, reduce the uh, emission even in the aircraft industry, of course. Um, so where I'm going to concentrate, as I mentioned before, I'm going to concentrate on carbon emission uh, reduction by uh, reducing the uh, disturbance in the airflow that is drag, which is an horizontal force. Um, so this drag force could be uh, reduced. And then if uh, through this research, I have achieved that solution. And then if we reduce this drag force, we can able to reduce the thrust required to push the front, uh, aircraft frontward. So that's how it is connected. Um, so uh, how I'm going to approach the drag reduction uh, problem. So this uh, is of many kinds. There are many types of drag on aircraft. We have got parasite drag, for example, a fighter, bomber, uh, these sort of aircrafts will have uh, armaments. And then uh, let's say if you have got a rescue helicopter, which is also an aircraft, of course, it will have uh, some rescue uh, accessories at the bottom of it that will add uh, more drag. So there are many drags like interference drag, uh, form drag, pressure drag. So in this uh, project, I'm going to concentrate on the skin friction drag, which contributes to the maximum amount of total drag in uh, commercial aircraft because commercial aviation is what we're discussing uh, today. So if the drag is reduced, then of course we could able to reduce the requirement for the thrust, which will reduce the carbon emission. Uh, so this is how it is connected. Uh, so how I'm going to uh, achieve that? I'm going to achieve that by 
uh, using the computation fluid dynamics method. Uh, I'm going to use an uh, uh, soft I have used a software uh, named uh, ANSYS Fluent, and then based on that uh, software, uh, I have achieved the drag reduction. So now uh, about the carbon emission, we have discussed about the demand for the uh, aircraft for the next 20 years. And then here I have given you a short idea about the emission contribution. So Europe, uh, the emission contribution that is expected to reach 337.5, uh, which is quite a lot when you compare to, uh, the, this is the expectation for 2050, and that is a lot when you compare to the 2019 uh, emission. So it is good, the aviation emissions going to skyrocket, and India from 29.3 in 2019 to 179.3 in uh, 2015. So that's a lot. And it's not only in one continent. If you look at uh, the Latin America, North America, is your Pacific region, China, of course, it's it's drastic. It is in increasing drastically, so we have to address this problem now. Otherwise, we'll be reaching uh, the the global warming uh, rate might reach up to three or four degrees Celsius quite soon. Um, so I have a solution, um, as I have uh, explained you at the beginning, that it's it's going to be biomimetic and aerodynamics combined solution. I hope you could see the um, shark that is swimming at the background. So this is a requiem kind of shark, and then you know that sharks could swim faster in water, and uh, it has a, a specific skin texture. So that skin, skin texture on the shark helps the shocks to uh, reduce the disturbance in the water, and then it helps the uh, uh, sorry, not aircraft, <laughs> um, the fish to swim faster in water. So this is actually an incredible thing because um, I don't know whether you have experienced uh, like chasing by sharks. Uh, sharks could swim much faster than a, a normal fish, and there are many various types of uh, sharks. And then this requiem type of uh, shark skin uh, uh, is the much faster type, and then that uh, skin as texture helps in the uh, fluid flow disturbance reduction. Um, so based on this un, uh, the literature that uh, was said by Brian and uh, Bharat, the skin of fast swimming shocks exhibit triplet structures. We call this as triplet structure when we uh, so look into uh, the microscope um, we ha we can able to see the uh, texture very clearly. I'm going to uh, share that image in the next slide. So that that looks like an alignment alignment to the flow, and then the direction of the flow and the direction of that scales are quite similar, which helps the uh, water to flow over that uh, skin texture very gently, smoothly, and that helps the uh, shocks to. Uh, move faster in water. So this reduces the skin friction drag in the turbulent flow regime, which is what we are looking for uh, in this particular research uh, I have uh, done. So a biomimetic, the research hypothesis, a biomimetic shock skin pattern uh, will reduce the drag in fluid flow. That was the hypothesis I came up with. And this new surface pattern will help to improve the uh, fuel reduction on aircraft. Of course, we uh, need this very much by improving the aerodynamics. The aerodynamics here, I'm referring to the drag force reduction. And I hope you can able to uh, see the microscopic view of the shock skin uh, structure. This is at the background with the dark uh, background, and you could see the microscopic image. It's just a one scale uh, that is uh, from the group of skin texture. Uh, so you could see this over here that it, it is uh, aligned vertically to the flow direction. So this is considered to be the uh, head section through which the uh, flow enters. Uh, when I say flow, that is the water flow enters. And then through this uh, uh, end, the water flow will leave from the, the skin texture of the shock. And then this alignment actually makes the water flow linear. So if there is any linear flow, that contributes to a higher amount of 
performance of that structure and then that reduces disturbance in that structure. So that is what we are looking for. So based on this uh, microscopic image of the shock skin texture, I have uh, developed a 3D pattern that is three dimensional pattern using a, a software named SOLIDWORKS, which is quite similar to the uh, surface structure of the shock skin. And this is the pattern. I named it as raw blood pattern. Uh, and if you look at the uh, top surface of this raw blood, raw blood pattern and the uh, microscopic image, you could see those uh, similarities, especially the alignment and the uh, head section uh, and the tail section okay, and, and the end section. So this is the raw blood pattern, which is going to be applied on the aircraft surfaces. And now uh, I'm going to discuss about the uh, method that I have used. Uh, so this is the aircraft. Uh, cross section, we call this as an aerofoil. The cross section of an aircraft wing is called as an aerofoil. So I am going to reduce the uh, skin friction drag on the surface of the wing. So this is the uh, 3D design of the wing, which is at the left bottom of this uh, uh, slide. And uh, this image uh, shows the uh, cross section of the uh, aircraft wing. So once the three dimensional structure was made using the uh, SOLIDWORKS uh, software, I have imported that design into an analysis software named ANSYS Fluent. And in that ANSYS Fluent, the design was meshed. Uh, so meshing in uh, computational fluid dynamics uh, terminology, we, we uh, call it literally like dividing solid structures into many small finite elements. Uh, so we have divided that uh, into many small computational uh, domain like this. So this is the polyhedral mesh, which uh, you could in which you could see the divided domains. Then we divided further by uh, meshing further. I'm just going uh, showing you the preview of the uh, preliminary mesh. So once we done the mesh, we analyze the uh, uh, flow over this uh, mesh to surface. So this is the uh, mesh surface, and then we have uh, I have done the um, airflow over the um, aircraft wing. Uh, that is that will look like this. Probably you could see it a bit more clearly if I zoom in. So these are all the uh, flow vectors. So this is the airflow over the aircraft wing. I hope I don't know whether you could be able to see those color differences clearly. Uh, if you could see the color difference, if it shows green, which means that uh, structure is uh, experiencing very good uh, um, airflow performance. And if you if you are seeing, let, let's say that uh, red colored uh, structure, which means that there is a disturbance in the flow, which contributes to higher amount of pressure. Uh, so how an aircraft wing generates a lift force? So we normally try to uh, achieve lower amount of pressure on the top of the wing, and then we try to achieve a higher amount of pressure at the bottom of the wing. So the key to generate good amount of lift force on an aircraft wing is to keep uh, the pressure as minimum as possible on the top surface uh, of the wing. So if you see uh, the red colored um, flow lines that says that the pressure is at higher value, which means that uh, the there is high disturbance and that is not good for lift generation. And uh, this is what the real problem. So I have um, analyzed the basic structure of the uh, aircraft wing, and then I have studied the disturbances. I could uh, I study the disturbances uh, happening, especially at the leading edge. We call this as leading edge. That is the um, uh, end from where the flow start to enter over the surface of the aircraft wing. So you could see the red colored flow lines at the leading edge and then at the, at the trailing end, uh, there is uh, green colored flow lines, which means that the flow is uh, good. We have got less pressure, less pressure at that uh, section. So this is the um, NACA wing. This is the type of wing that I have used. Uh, and this is another type of uh, wing, we, I call it as uh, the 3VBLR, that is uh, a NACA wing with three raw blood pattern implemented on the 
uh, wing surface where I have found the issue at six degree uh, angle of attack. So we can tilt the wing surface and then a different angle of attack. Then we can test the disturbance and then I have found disturbances in this area. I also found disturbance in this area. Uh, I have um, uh, applied this rotable pattern in seven different ways. I am showing you only three different uh, ways. This is just a part of my PhD work. So uh, these three different ways will give you an idea about how the uh, rotable pattern that was designed in the uh, previous um, uh, session section was implemented here. For example, if you look at here, this looks like a hollow section. Uh, so this is the hollow pattern applied uh, on the surface of the aircraft wing in different ways, wherever the disturbances were identified on the original wing surface, a different angle of attack. And uh, here you could see the extruded um, patterned biomimetic um, aerofoil where you could see the extruded, that is some protruded surface. And then uh, this is a rod, rod blood pattern placed fully on the surface, top surface of the wing. So I have analyzed the uh, airflow performance uh, of this uh, rotor blade pattern. Remember the rotor blade pattern was functioning effectively on the um, shock skin texture, which was in water flow. And I'm trying to um, develop a solution in, in the airflow because, you know, air is uh, what the main flow that we are considering here because we are talking about aircraft. So at the end of my research analysis using ANSYS Fluent, uh, I have got the research, results like this. This is the original wing, uh, and this is the uh, structure of the 3DB LLR, that is three diagonal uh, biomimetic low depth pattern. So we have got four different types. And this is a 3db LLR, which is at the bottom left uh, side of the screen. And then that shows all most of the designs out of seven designs, uh, four designs had shown positive results. I'm just uh, explaining you a part of my research. So I'm just showing you the two uh, types which shown uh, the highly positive results. And so this is the 3db LLR and that uh, at the bottom, and that is the uh, NACA original wing uh, that was developed by a national committee, uh, advisory committee for aeronautics by NASA. So that wing showed um, performance like this, low performance, um, of course, green colored um, structure on the top uh, surface of the aircraft wing shows uh, low pressure, but this uh, blue colors uh, 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 flow lines on the top surface of the uh, 3db LLR, that is the raw blood implemented wing shows much lower amount of the pressure you could see the color code at the top left uh, so what does that mean so this is the color code for higher amount of pressure which shows red and this is orange and then uh, green and the blue comes at the bottom so from this you can able to easily understand that of course it is at the mid level of the color code uh, which is uh, performing at the uh, medium range but when you look at this very low level because of the blue color code you can able to clearly identify the uh, much lower amount of um, pressure acting on the top surface of the um, uh, aircraft wing, which is what we require. So based on this uh, draw a blood pattern implemented on the surface of the wing, uh, I have achieved 6.32 percentage of drag reduction in 3db LLR model and 10.73 uh, percentage of lift increment in 3db LLR model. So once we reduce the drag, we could also achieve the lift. So I have shown different results here to give you an understanding about uh, how these things are connected. So now uh, how it is uh, achieved, how it was achieved. Uh, the main um, theory uh, behind the drag reduction was based on this at the very top. So when the uh, apps start to enter the uh, leading edge of the aircraft wing, and then um, at let's say uh, when we are trying to um, uh, study the aircraft uh, wing disturbances, there were much disturbances identified at higher angle of attack. Let's say if you uh, move the aircraft wing at eight degrees, 10 degrees, 12 degrees, during that time, uh, the higher amount of uh, drag reduction was noted. So this raw rib blood pattern implemented on the top surface of the aircraft wing helped to uh, re-reverse the flow. So we want the flow to get straightened 
and then we want the flow to start here and then move over uh, this surface and then leave through this uh, trailing edge. But what happens at the higher angle of attack, instead of leaving the trailing edge, the flow is starting to reverse in the middle and that flow reversal is uh, creating too much of disturbance, which we, we don't want to experience. And, and this raw river pattern is capturing those re-reversing re uh, reversing flows. And then that uh, reversing flows enters when it enters into this um, cavity. It circulates and it gets elevated above the top surface and then it gets straightened. So it, the reverse flow enters, that circulates and elevates, and then finally it gets straightened, and then it will get along with the uh, other normal um, airflow, and then that's how uh, I, I was able to achieve uh, le less disturbances in this flow, and then that helped me to achieve less, less amount of drag. Now comparing the raw riblet pattern to existing uh, similar solutions, uh, this is the only pattern uh, that has uh, shown positive result in both both uh, water flow and uh, air flow. I have also tested uh, this raw blood pattern uh, on the internal walls of pipe. Uh, so it showed a tremendous amount of performance improvement in, in pipe, not only on the external uh, flow or an aircraft wing. In addition to that, uh, it also showed uh, promising results in the internal flow. So this make met very uh, effective this uh, solution very effective. Then I have received a causal molecule uh, best paper award for this uh, research publication. So the key takeaways, it's the biomimetic pattern. So the biomimetic uh, pattern is leading in drag reduction. And this was the uh, part of my PGC research work that I did, uh, of course. And then uh, this um, was covering only one part of the aviation that is the commercial aviation specifically the international aviation but uh, we need to focus more on all sorts of aviation and uh, this type of solution need to be tested on, on a real aircraft in real time condition although it was validated computationally experimentally in, in the lab so we we have got many areas that we can look at uh, from um, from hot air balloon from monoplane, from UAVs uh, to airships, cargo aircraft, and so on. So what I developed further from that research was trying to apply that solution, um, similar, developing similar sort of solution and applying that on an UAV because in the recent times, UAV has reached uh, uh, a higher amount of attraction because of the um, use of drones in the Ukraine um, uh, war and also uh, U UAVs are uh, used much for surveillance at, uh, at borders for security purposes. And you can also have a look at the global UAV market prediction. It is uh, expected to rise up to $48.75 billion. Uh, so it, in short amount of time. And then this is saying something that there will be a large amount of UAVs in operation uh, during that time and the uh, UAV market is going to um, increase uh, a lot. So um, I have um, uh, thought about trying to uh, test this on a real time aircraft. So U UAV, of course, which has got uh, turbo uh, jet powered uh, UAVs, which could uh, uh, be an um, uh, focus area, not only the military UAVs, we can also focus on the commercial UAVs. So the skills that that that, that is required to achieve this um, research idea uh, should be based on the com computational investigation, um, additive manufacturing skills, surface structure development, experimental analysis, and UAV flight test skills. So these are the skills that, that is required uh, to develop this per, per, uh, proposal and then to develop this research further and uh, to uh, expand this view and then apply on different fields of aviation. So based on that, uh, I started to search for researchers uh, who are working in the same uh, or related area through the uh, uh, connections that I have and through the journal publications available online. And then I contacted them uh, via email and they responded positively. And we have discussed and finally we have got the collaboration needed. So I have now collaborated. I have now initiated collaborated with 
three different universities, one university in Malaysia, University Science Malaysia, and Mo Mohan Babu University in India, and Tetic University, of course, is in Slovakia, uh, with visiting researchers with similar sort of interest. And uh, we also got two project partners, uh, the University of Science Malaysia and Mohan Babu uh, University in India. They also they were also um, uh, agreed to happily support this project. Um, so this collaboration initiated and then we, we are uh, going to submit a, a research proposal for uh, the ECL, EPSRC's International Collaboration Fund uh, next week. We are hoping for the best and then I hope uh, that we could uh, develop this research further and that's it about research and collaboration from me for today thank you everyone fantastic thank you very much Siva. that was again just fascinating um uh i will just firstly look to see if um there are questions from our online guests uh, before i jump in with my amateur questions that's fine <laughs> <laughs> does anybody have anything they'd like to ask or respond to so here um, comes the safety expert <laughs> okay islam did you want to offer anything into the conversation uh martin has put a question in the chat oh right? has he yeah okay right political oh, you've got a, yes both. i've got <laughs> questions for both of you actually from martin let's go to let's let's um would so siva martin asks you uh would the wonderful biomimetic riblet application really offset the proposed increase in aircraft production um and i guess then it's a joint question for you both following on from that that turbines and riblets will only play their part within a wider change of policy um uh and practice in climate change mitigation which i guess yes we would all acknowledge that that um no one thing is going to solve the the you know the crisis that we're in so but perhaps we go back to that to that first part of martin's question um you know in terms of the offset uh of this proposed increase in production siva uh, hi Martin, Th thank you for Hello. your question. <laughs> um, I think um, although we have got um, this new solutions coming up, uh, like biomimetic blood application, um, I, I don't think it will diminish the uh, aircraft production because um, there are many aircraft in operation uh, since the start of the 19th century, of course, and uh, there are many old uh, yeah, version of yeah. aircraft and they are trying to upgrade the old aircraft and then they are uh, on one side uh, they are trying to upgrade the old aircraft and they're trying to bring in the new version through which we can able to uh, reduce the emission further on the other side they would like to accommodate the increasing number of passengers uh, worldwide uh, so the the demand is uh, really high, especially after COVID, because people had not had not travelled during that uh, one year period of time uh, because of the restrictions worldwide. There is a sudden increase in the aviation market, and then they're trying to uh, accommodate all the passengers they could, um, and and the uh, the backlog that I mentioned until 2022, which was around. Uh, 7,000 aircraft backlog just by Airbus, one manufacturer in Europe. Uh, so um, this sort of solution will try to mitigate the uh, climate change, but I, I don't think it will uh, diminish the aircraft production. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> the demand is still growing, but that's good for us, uh, like an aeronautical engineer. But on the <laughs> on the one side, but on the other side, it's not good for the environment. Uh, mm -hmm. So, in addition to this, there are also many other techniques like hydrogen powered engine. Yes. Um, the Airbus is coming up with. Uh, so they're also trying to co concentrate on zero emission aircraft. Um, so I'm proposing things aerodynamically, and there are many aspects like aqua propulsion. We can also reduce the weight further in the modern version uh, of aircraft that is less weight, travel light, 
um, concept. So there are many things around to mitigate the climate change uh, in the thing, but unfortunately, that's the reality. <laughs> I, I hope I have answered your question. Yes, um, I'm just curious if you, both of you feel frustrated that you know, you're making your contributions, but the wider universities, governments, companies might still sort of pursue the wider policies that don't bring the full benefits that both of you are showing. Yes, and also I think it's about um, the funding, um, because, for example, in my research, we, we did everything uh, lab, we verified everything inside the lab. But when if, we, if I want to um, verify it on a real time aircraft, that that's going to cost us a lot. Uh -huh. and, yeah. and, and, and that's why uh, instead of going for a real time aircraft, uh, I'm now going for an UAV, uh, which we, we could afford it. Again, we require fun for that. Uh, I, I think uh, we could get it at least some point for UAV when you compare the cost of real time aircraft test. So again, the, there is a gap between the research uh, outcome and then bringing that into reality. So yes. that gap need to be filled, as you rightly mentioned, with the uh, relevant and appropriate government policies to is support that, people like us. Yeah. Is that an issue for you too, Islam, that big companies yeah. might be hesitant to try it out or put money into proper research to prove the, the concept? Yeah, it is. It's also applicable to the uh, the idea of integrating wind turbines within the built environment. And without uh, like politicians adopting these approaches and uh, governments providing subsidies for uh, these technologies to be affordable by the public and by companies to develop research as well, it's it's not going to be uh, possible to like um, to have it on a large scale. Like uh, for example, the the technology of urban wind turbines, it has to be mass produced so that the costs would be less. Because for example, nowadays like the the payback period of time for these wind turbines is ridiculously long like uh, 20 yeah. something years so uh, nobody can afford that unless there is subsidies from the government and encouragement but as as i've mentioned in the when it comes to wind turbines specifically wind turbines within the built environment there is another value of uh, this type of integration which is the visual message yes of like having these wind turbines out there people seeing them as a reminder to people about the the climate crisis we're going through so that people on a much smaller scale in their houses would be taking uh, some actions to reduce their carbon footprint so this has value in itself as well so it's, it's not just about the wind that's generated no. uh, the power generated from these uh, wind uh, turbines that, that's mm -hmm. what reminded me of what i put in the chat the picture of the turbine in in at Hull as part of their city of culture um, I think it helps close the gap between people thinking there's this distant threat on the hill of the turbine rather than seeing it close up and it changes them. I think both of you, it, it inspires young scientists really that biomimicry is such a resource. Perhaps it changes one's attitude to nature that there's so much to learn from existing um, fauna and flora, and therefore you shouldn't destroy it too, too suddenly. And yes. similarly, that um, wind power is, I, I, yeah, I, I was very struck going up to Kiel to see their wind turbines. It, far from a blot on the landscape, when I look across to the hill now, it, the light's always different, it's going at a different angle. It enhances the view. It doesn't detract from it for me. And th that's yeah. a good statement, Martin. Yeah, we have solutions in nature, and then we can use the solution to sh save the nature. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I think that ties in really beautifully with, you know, if we're thinking about collaborations in the broader sense, you know, we can think about uh, that we are trying, you know, that we're using those kinds of collaborative learnings from from nature to try and yes yeah, support nature. Um, 
I, I, again, thinking about collaborations, and and you did mention Siva that you you know you, you're already working now because you've reached out to to fellow researchers in in different institutions, and you're working together, um, I guess, to try and get some buy-in to to actually test you know in the real uh, your findings. Um, just how how difficult is that part of the process? I mean, in some ways, you know, the PhD exists, the research exists, but in a way, perhaps the hardest part is now to come. Does it feel a bit like that? <laughs> yes, it, it, it was really hard to um, find collaborators. Um, even the I think researchers are like us, they are very they are willing to collaborate and then the support um, the the boost that they require even from their institutions. And when we go internationally, I, um, it's not about um, only collaboration. I think that there come some formalities and procedures that we need to uh, look at either side um, because they want to be more careful. And then we also want to be more careful when we co collaborate with an international pro pro uh, collaborators. Are they reputed? And then uh, do they have professional standing? And then um, e e this will this collaboration is going to um, um, give, bring out the results as expected uh, and uh, in what way that we could uh, get the support, what are the ways uh, are there actually uh, to get the support? There are many questions that, that, mm. that, that was arisen and then in the proposal that I have developed, which is um, going to be submitted next week. Um, uh, luckily, <laughs> I've, I've already crossed those hard things. And then it's been, I'm trying to um, submit this thing since I joined here. I joined in this university on uh, October 2021. <laughs> so it's it's like, um, you know, <laughs> a roller coaster. <laughs> we start it and then there will be a pause and then there will be a gap. And there will be no communication at all for a few times. And then there is a difference in time, of course. Mm. Yeah, you, it is a start of the day in in, in uh, yeah. here, and then for them it's end of the day in Malaysia. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that there are some reality uh, things uh, that I had to go through. Not only the uh, research point of view. Um, when we when we go globally uh, in collaboration, um, there there were many hurdles, and then there are still hurdles. And then I I hope that. Uh, we will get the fund <laughs> if approved that would be really great and then we could really impact uh, greatly and do you and I, I guess perhaps one last question because i realize time's ticking on but in that in that regard and when we're talking about collaboration and we always say it's such a positive and and it's you know we're, we're being asked to collaborate for ref and this and that mm. uh, but at the end of the day it's your research you you know it's your uh, you've developed this concept and this idea. And so if you're going to work across teams internationally and potentially have to also bring on board funding bodies, maybe even uh, commercial, you know, private um, money, capital, et cetera, how do you stay in charge of that project? Well, I would say... Uh... That is left to, left to be seen. <laughs> yeah, because I have thought about it. When we go internationally, and then uh, if we have got many collaborators, and then uh, there there are good and bad things in collaboration, which you rightly mentioned. That um, I'm although I'm going to lead this team technically. Um, that that's how I propose, and then that's how uh, I'm I'm going to do because uh, at the end of the day, it's my research. Uh, I, I don't want to um, um, make this into <laughs> uh, other works. I don't want to let this go. <laughs> but but it's just, it's a difficult one, isn't it? It's yeah. it's still hard. I'm really. Uh, finding it hard to say, but I, I would say just this. Let this have to be seen. That's an ongoing, I'll get back to you probably yeah, get back after. To, absolutely, you can feed back <laughs> this time next year as to as yeah. to where that's sitting because you know I think that's really interesting for people to think about. Is it's great to open the doors and invite people in to mm. our research and our work, but then is you know what happens? Is there a little power struggle that starts to play out, or what yeah. happens there? So, I mean, there, there are other 
aspects that I have looked at, like I am transferring the biomimetics and aerodynamic skills to them through this research, and they are transferring UAV flight sales uh, test skills and uh, additive manufacturing skills and also uh, vibration reduction skills. So uh, I think in that way, uh, if you look at that way, um, this collaboration is a good idea. It's genuine, yeah, 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 and useful. Fantastic. I think unless anyone has anything else, that's a really lovely place to leave this um, on in that regard. And um, thank you, Martin. And yes, it's been great. Um, yes, we didn't know that speak <laughs> until together. we presented yeah. today. <laughs> yes, fabulous. So um, thank you both so much, and. Uh, I thank you all for, for attending and those of you that are listening in the recording. I'm sure if you do have questions, um, you can contact these two eminent researchers via their staff's email addresses and, and have a have a dialogue with them. So so um, there we go. And I want to thank you all. There'll be uh, another seminar upcoming in, in hopefully around a month to six weeks time. I will try and give people lots of lead time. Um, and in the meantime, I will post the link to this um, recording online and want to say thanks to everybody again. So thank you both and thanks to the audience. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.